thank you so much for the opportunity to speak at this conference. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, I'm Pete Chabolt. I'm a co-founder of PsyQuantum. Uh, and I'm going to uh, say something about work we've been doing at the company uh, towards photonic quantum computing. So I'll spend just a couple of minutes introducing the company. Uh, I'll give my perspective on the kind of state of play of quantum computing. I'll spend most of the time on recent technical progress and then just spend a minute or two on our future direction. So we're a startup company. We're based in California. We're about 250 people. Almost all of those people are technical. And they're all working together really just to do one thing, which is to deliver a universal fault-tolerant optical quantum computer. The founding thesis of the company from about 2015 uh, is firstly that error correction is going to be required to do anything commercially valuable with a quantum computer. Secondly, that error-corrected systems are going to be very big. You're going to need on the order of a million qubits uh, uh, for useful systems. And once you accept that premise, we've always been of the belief that photonics becomes a very attractive platform to, with which to build one of these large, extensive systems. Um, I also hope that a theme at PsyQuantum has been technical maturity. Obviously, these two aircraft perform fundamentally the same stunt, but only the one on the right-hand side is actually commercially valuable. There's also, obviously, a few billion dollars and decades of work between these two systems. Um, and I think that this is broadly where the whole industry of quantum computing is at, which is that the scientific demonstrations and the qubits are in really good shape. Uh, incredible work has been done over the years, and uh, most teams can now do very impressive demonstrations uh, of qubits. We'd still like to make those a little better. Um, but I think it's also fair to say that the real challenges that are preventing us from delivering on the promise of quantum computing as an industry I would say are more like scaling challenges. And I like to enumerate them as manufacturability, cooling power, connectivity, and control electronics. I think these themes have been widely represented across this, this conference. We don't like photons because they necessarily make a better qubit. Rather, we like them because they seem to have orders of magnitude type of advantages in overcoming these scaling challenges. So we can build photonic qubits in a regular semiconductor chip foundry. Uh, the photons themselves don't feel heat. Uh, we do need cryogenic cooling uh, for single photon detection. All photonic quantum computers require cryogenic cooling, uh, as far as we understand today. Uh, but they can operate at much higher temperature, so in the ballpark of 4 Kelvin, rather than the 10 millikelvin that's required uh, by some other systems. This can be very advantageous. Uh, we have big advantages in networking in that we can send qubits from one fridge to the next fridge using conventional optical fiber and without transduction. And we've already demonstrated teleportation and entanglement between chips using off-the-shelf, uh, using conventional optical fiber. Uh, and then finally, uh, as we build more complex systems, it becomes very desirable to put complex control electronics close to the qubits. That's much easier if your qubits are not sensitive to heat or electromagnetic interference. Um, and so, you know, myself and my co-founders had been working for a combined 15 years, uh, combined 60 years in academia by the time we started the company. In that context, we demonstrated lots of small systems of entangled photonic qubits, state tomographies, bell, to, uh, bell tests, process tomographies. Uh, we had, uh, as far as I know, the first quantum processor on the internet about a decade ago. That's that system in the top right-hand corner. We did the first demonstration of the variational quantum eigensolver with our colleagues at Harvard around 2013. And, you know, had a wonderful time in academia making these small-scale demonstrations, publishing lots of papers and so on. All the time that we were doing that, we knew in our minds that there were much bigger, much more expensive, hard engineering problems that really needed to be solved to deliver on the promise of photonic quantum computing. I've enumerated them here. So we knew that we would need high-volume semiconductor manufacturing to build very large numbers of very good chips. Uh, we need single photon sources and single photon detectors with very high performance, extremely good waveguides, extremely good coupling from the waveguide into optical fiber. One of the biggest pieces is that we need a very, very good optical switch to overcome the intrinsic non-determinism uh, of single photon uh, quantum computing. Uh, we need very low latency control electronics, most likely inside the cryostat um, uh, connected to that photonics and we need to massively increase the amount of cryogenic cooling power that we're deploying. 
Finally, we need very good um, architectures, uh, better than the previous state of the art. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this final point. Naomi Nickerson, our VP of Quantum Architecture, is also speaking at this conference. She will talk about architecture. I recommend that you go and see her talk. I'm going to talk about hardware. This is a map of the hardware uh, in a photonic quantum computer. Basically, there are a handful of photonic components. Most of those are actually classical components, like waveguides and splitters and so on. Uh, there are a few quantum components, like single photon detectors. Those get lithographically fabricated onto a silicon chip using a stack of materials that you can see here. Those photonic chips then get packaged optically and electrically into what you can think of as a motherboard. Some of those motherboards run at room temperature, some of them run at cryogenic temperature, but we're going to need to then package a whole bunch of those boards into what you can see uh, towards the right-hand side here, which is a cryogenic cabinet containing a whole bunch of boards. And then we're going to need many of those racks or cabinets networked together with conventional optical fiber in a large facility to deliver on useful applications. Psyquantum, as an organization, has made thousands of wafers of silicon, millions and millions of components. So we've got the left-hand side of this chart uh, pretty well covered. We've built a pretty large number of these board-level assemblies, and we have not yet demonstrated one of these cryogenic cabinets. We're building these now. We're machining them, so they're being actively constructed, uh, but they're not done yet. I want to look at just one of these components to illustrate how things get interesting when you take scale seriously. So this is a single photon detector. This is how we read out the state uh, of our photonic qubits. And in principle, it's a beautiful, simple device. The photon is flying uh, in the waveguide. It gets absorbed into a superconducting nanowire. The nanowire goes normal. It becomes resistive. And then from that uh, resistance, we can uh, detect the presence of the single photon. Uh, in principle, this can be a 100% efficient detector. It's a beautiful dream uh, device, but we're going to need millions of them. Uh, when we started the company, our conviction was that uh, there are very few places on planet Earth that can make that happen at the level of process control, uh, integration, volume, yield, etc. that we're going to need uh, for a real quantum computer. That's TSMC, Global Foundry, Samsung, Intel, one or two other places around the world. These guys buy, build laptops and cell phones. Basically, nobody else does. And so we set ourselves a pretty uh, uh, thrilling challenge of taking quantum computing into that uh, mature manufacturing environment. Um, we're obviously a startup company. We're trying to go really, really fast. Um, and I think it's worth remembering that in the semiconductor industry, it's pretty normal, actually, to build a prototype of something one year. The following year, to then go to the foundries, the fabs, the contract manufacturers, the packaging houses, order a 1,000 units, and expect those units to show up on your doorstep and actually work properly. Of course, we're doing something that's more exotic. We make things really difficult. Uh, but it's exactly that type of leverage that we want to deploy to get to large systems quickly. So we're very fortunate that we've been working with Global Foundries for more than three years now. We've put six tools into the production line uh, in Fishkill. We've done seven tape outs. We've made, made thousands of wafers of silicon. Uh, Fishkill is the former IBM fab. It's the oldest Global Foundries facility. It's more R&D oriented. And so it gives me great pleasure to report that we've actually moved from the small house into the big house. Uh, so we've moved into Malta, which is the premier uh, production-oriented uh, foundry uh, for, for GF. Um, we've put, uh, we're putting twice as many tools into Malta as we did into Fishkill. Uh, we've already taped out there. We've got a team in the clean room. And to have pulled that off during a global semiconductor supply chain crisis, especially given the exotic nature of what we do, single photon detectors and so on, uh, is a huge testament to the, the team at Psyquantum. I'm very happy that that's happened. As we start to make more and more silicon, of course, we create a testing problem for ourselves. And in general, quantum computing has a big testing problem, which is that if you need a million qubits, you're going to have to test billions of devices. If it takes you one hour to test a device, then you never get a quantum computer. So we're very lucky that many of the things that go wrong in a photonic quantum computer are actually classical and be, can be characterized at room temperature using robots like this one, which we buy off of the shelf from the semiconductor industry. So this has allowed us to test millions of devices in a completely automated fashion. There is still a whole bunch of cryogenic tests that we have to do, um, but this really takes the edge off of it. Um, and we have now two of these systems running pretty much 24-7. We have four more on order, and we have a pretty big fleet of uh, automated cryogenic tests. I want to look at what's inside one of these chips. These are pretty complex. 
This is a 25 layer, 500 step manufacturing process on a 300 millimeter wafer. We stood that up pretty much from scratch. Um, and here what you're looking at is a cross section of one of these chips as fabricated at Global Foundries. So what you can see is the silicon waveguide where the uh, photons live. That's a few hundred nanometers wide. And then on top of that, you see uh, nibium nitride superconducting nanowires that we put uh, into that manufacturing process. If we zoom out a little on this device, you can see uh, the single photon detector on top of the waveguide. You can also see a whole bunch of metal. That metal is there because the laser light that we shine into the chip is about one trillion times more intense than the single photons that we detect on the chip. So there's an optical dynamic range of about 120 dB. Um, you're also seeing cross sections here uh, from these chips. And this is what you're really paying for at somewhere like Global Foundries to achieve uh, this level of control over the critical dimensions, the integration, the line edge roughness, the process control with something this novel and complex. There are very few places that can actually do that. Here you see the full chip. It's 25 millimeters on a side. Uh, we actually, in some of these old systems, we mount that up uh, by atomically bonding it onto a one inch thick chunk of crystalline silicon that we use as a heat sink. We don't do that anymore, but that's an interesting thing to do. Uh, and then to prototype these systems today, uh, we're able to use just off-the-shelf cryostats. This is a regular off-the-shelf cryostat operating in the regime of four Kelvin or so. Uh, that's good enough for us to uh, prototype uh, the packaging and device performance and so on. Um, but as you heard, we're moving to much more advanced cryostats. I'll talk about that in a second. And for context, this gives us about a watt of heat dissipation which is about a thousand times more heat dissipation than you typically get from a dilution refrigerator. Um, again, what we're really paying for here is very good process control. Uh, you can see that represented in these wafer maps in the top left. Uh, so if you were to measure the width of the nanowire between two separate wafers, it would be the same to within two nanometers. And if you were to measure the film thickness, it would be consistent to within better than an angstrom. Um, that's what we're really paying for. That's the kind of process control that you need to build large-scale quantum computers, uh, in our opinion. That translates to device performance. So the intrinsic efficiency of these detectors is so close to 100% that it's very, very difficult to measure. Uh, what's more interesting is the system efficiency, where we take into account the waveguide loss, the coupling efficiency, and so on. 88% of our detectors have a system efficiency better than 88%, and the best detectors have an efficiency uh, around about 95%. We need to be closer to 99%. I'll talk about how we're going to get there. Uh, you also see on this slide preliminary data from number resolving single photon detectors. So we need to be able to count up to about three photons in the mode uh, for the architecture for optical quantum computing. We've built devices that can do that. You can see here preliminary data. We're achieving about 95% separation uh, between these photon number buckets. How are we going to get to from 95 to 99%? One of the big things that we're going to do is to switch from a silicon waveguide, which is nice to work with but pretty lossy, uh, to a silicon nitride uh, waveguide, uh, which can be much, much lower loss. Silicon nitride is hard to work with. You can see uh, some of the things that people don't normally show you in the middle here. So there's a lot of grind, expensive, hard work. We've been through hundreds of wafers and a lot of pain and suffering uh, to get this going. But we now have silicon nitride under very good control. Uh, at the top of this graph here, you see the best waveguide loss that we've seen from silicon waveguides. At the bottom of the chart, you see the target uh, for useful quantum computing. And then you can see two years of hard work to bring down the losses in silicon nitride waveguides. As you can see, we're not quite there, but we're in really, really good shape. This is incredibly good uh, silicon nitride uh, and very, very encouraging data, uh, for me at least. Um, as far as single photon generation, we use those same waveguides to build resonance structures that generate pairs of photons. So we don't use uh, NV centers in diamond or quantum dots. Uh, we just use spontaneous four-wave mixing type sources. With a simple ring resonator on the left, you can achieve 90% purity. Using slightly more advanced designs, we've demonstrated 99.5% purity. And then going forward, we're going to use these more complex arrays of ring resonators where we expect to be able to hit about 99.9% .9 purity single photon generation. One of the big themes that we've seen represented more broadly across this conference is that you need to get light out of an optical waveguide and into a fiber with incredibly high efficiency. Telecom industry does this today, but with nowhere near good enough performance for fault tolerance, for error correction. And so Psyquantum has made a big investment in solving this problem. We have developed a new design for an edge coupler. 
Uh, that's a manufacturable design that's compatible with the type of flows that we have at GF. Uh, we've built those uh, devices. Um, here's an image of a different coupler, just a regular coupler, um, butted up against an optical fiber. But you want to try and get light out of that waveguide and into the fiber with roughly 99% efficiency. That's an extremely difficult thing to do. Here is some very early data from our most recent devices where you can see we're in the ballpark of 98% efficiency. So there's still a lot of work to do here in turning this into a manufacturable assembly that we can build in very large numbers. But the fact that we can do this at all, uh, to me, is actually extremely, extremely encouraging. And we're very serious about getting this problem solved. Um, one of the, you know, if there was just one uh, technical challenge that I would say has been holding back photonic quantum computing, it's the need for multiplexing. Uh, in a photonic quantum computer, pretty much everything is non-deterministic, single photon generation and entangling operations uh, specifically. Um, and whilst the error correcting code has some leniency, it's quite resilient to failure, it is nonetheless absolutely necessary to do trial until success. You have to take your non-deterministic operations, do them a bunch of times, and pick the successful outcome. Um, and of course, you only need to multiplex up to uh, the tolerance of the error correcting code. And you also only have to scale that multiplexing up to the scale of the biggest system that you build. And for context, the largest entangled resource states that we build in our current architectures for optical quantum computing are on the order of 20 to 30 qubits. And that's independent of the problem size. So no matter how many logical qubits or gate operations you're targeting, uh, that stays constant. But we're definitely going to have to do multiplexing, and it's really hard. You have to take a whole bunch of non-deterministic operations, you run them all in parallel, and then you want to pick the output from the successful operation. That picking needs to be done with an endport optical switch uh, of the type that you see highlighted in this figure here. That, of course, is a classical device. There's nothing quantum about it. It's just routing light around in a chip. Um, but the optical phase shifting material needs to be really, really, really good uh, for fault tolerance. And so you can buy these things off the shelf from the telecom industry. So many of those are ba based on lithium niobate. Lithium niobate has an electro-optic coefficient of about 20 picometers per volt. We need something that's way better than that uh, materials-wise. So there's some options like uh, PZT and polymers. We basically swung for the fences. We picked the strongest electro-optic material known to science, which is barium titanate. In principle, that can have an electro-optic coefficient of about 1,000 picometers per volt. But it's the same thing. We're going to be putting a new material into the chip, just like we did with Nibium nitride. That's a big, expensive project. The sequence of events is very similar, which was that we need to develop thin film deposition. We need to be able to spray a high-quality material onto the wafer. Then we need to do lithography. Then we need to integrate that into a stack. And it's really this first piece that scares engineers, because it's material science. It's French patisserie. It's like artist artistic activity. Uh, that can cause, cause big problems. So we took it very seriously. We built a facility in San Jose. Um, there are five clean rooms in this facility. Inside one of those clean rooms is the biggest molecular beam epitaxy tool uh, that uh, we think has ever been built. So it's a 300 millimeter MBE tool for barium titanate. It's also a highly industrialized MBE tool. Normally when you think of molecular beam epitaxy, you think of universities and kind of research grade stuff. Um, this thing, as you can see, has a FOOP loader on the front we can load FOOPs of 25, 300 millimeter wafers in the front of the tool. A robot then moves those wafers into the chamber. Inside that chamber, there's molten titanium at a few thousand degrees Celsius. There's also liquid helium at a few degrees Kelvin. Um, it's a pretty extreme piece of equipment, uh, but that can deposit barium titanate onto those wafers. What's interesting is that this tool is then clean enough uh, that we can take a box of wafers out of the tool and FedEx that to global foundries and integrate that into a much more mature manufacturing flow. And we're already doing that. So we've built 300 millimeter wafers of BTO. We've shipped them to GF. We're doing lithography. And as you can see, that then gets integrated into something that's much more mature. So this was a big risk for us. Like This was, to be clear, a very, very risky thing for us to do. Um, it would not have been at all surprising if we had spent months looking at poor quality films and banging our heads on the wall. Um, uh, and just the, 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 it's such an important thing for photonic quantum computing to overcome this non-determinism problem. Um, so it gives me great pleasure uh, to report uh, that that didn't happen. The first wafers that we got out of the tool, Q1 of this year, had an electro-optic coefficient of 350 picometers per volt. 
by Q2 of this year, we'd improved that to 450 picometers per volt. And the most recent wafers that we're looking at have an electro-optic coefficient of about 1,000 picometers per volt, which is as strong as you can reasonably expect. So there is still a ton of work to do on film uniformity, uh, volume, yield. This is by no means a solved problem, um, but it is extremely encouraging to see these material properties. We have, of course, also built full switches with BTO. We've operated them at cryogenic temperature. We've operated them at gigahertz. Um, but yeah, to see this material coming out is personally like really, really exciting. Um, if you look across the literature, of course, there are many, many historical demonstrations of photonic qubits, uh, state tomographies, uh, two qubit entanglement experiments, and so on. But as is usually the case with these academic demonstrations, they always leave something out. There's always something that's swept under the carpet. And at PsyQuantum, we can't afford to do that. We have to solve all the problems uh, simultaneously. And so I want to show you work that we've been doing towards that. Uh, these are single qubit tomography experiments and two photon interference experiments where we're bringing much more of the unpleasantness that is required onto the chip. So specifically, these are fully integrated single photon sources, superconducting nanowire single photon detectors. The filtering is done on the chip, which again is 120 dB, factor of a trillion or so uh, of filtering. Um, and also thermal heaters on this chip. So we actually have thermal heaters which we use for phase shifters uh, that, are, that when we operate them are close to room temperature. Uh, we dissipate about half a watt of heat through these phase shifters, despite the fact that the photonic chip is at cryogenic temperature. Um, so ultimately those phase shifters will be removed and will be replaced with barium titanate, but that's a pretty good stand-in actually for a gigahertz switch that also will dissipate heat. So very extreme optical dynamic range, very extreme thermal dynamic range, lots of packaging. This is obviously a 25 layer chip. When you introduce all of this additional complexity, you might reasonably expect that the numbers get worse. And it's very nice to report uh, that that didn't happen. So this is single qubit uh, tomography uh, data from those systems where we're seeing 99.96% single qubit state preparation fidelity, 99.99% single qubit gate fidelity if you just abstract out the gate itself. This shouldn't be terribly surprising, um, but it's really, really an accomplishment of the team to manage uh, this level of complexity. Similar for two photon uh, experiments, we're seeing 99% uh, two photon interference uh, visibility from these same systems, again, with on chip filtering, on chip detectors, on chip sources, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Those systems have hundreds of wires. The systems that we're building now have thousands of wires. As we scale up, we increasingly want to bring CMOS into the cryostat. We've made a big investment in that. Uh, this is a cryo-CMOS ASIC that we developed and built. It's based on a 22 nanometer CMOS process, the same transistors that you find in your Bluetooth devices. There are three quarters of a billion transistors on this control chip. It has hundreds of detector readout circuits, hundreds of phase shifter drivers. Here you can see it packaged up with a photonic chip with superconducting detectors and single photon sources built at global foundries. You take that whole assembly, you put it in the cryostat at liquid helium temperature, and you cross your fingers <laughs> and hope, and it, did, it does actually work, which is extremely encouraging. So it's doing everything it was supposed to do. Um, currently, this is missing very fast electronics. Uh, that's coming in the next generation, so we're putting 32 gigabit SERDIs and half a gigabyte of SRAM into the next thing. These are really quite capable uh, control chips running at cryogenic temperature. And again, we can only really afford to do that because our photons can operate uh, in that kind of full Kelvin regime. Um, as you can see, we're getting ready to build bigger and bigger assemblies like this. That's going to place more demands on our cryogenic cooling. We'll move away from these off-the-shelf off -shelf systems. We're now building this cube that you see in the middle. That should give us about 10 watts of cryogenic cooling power. And as you heard, we're already building uh, these uh, cabinets, which should go well beyond that. So we're increasing the amount of available cryogenic cooling power by about a factor of 5 to 10 every year for the next few years. Um, and in that context, uh, well, I should comment on this. I appreciate I'm over time. Um, this is very much in the spirit of things that we have seen before at PsyQuantum, where like when the engineers come to me and say, we're going to put heaters in the cryostat, or we're going to build superconducting detectors in a laptop factory, or we're going to do 300 millimeter MBE, I'm often inclined to say, really? Like, that sounds crazy. Is that actually a good idea? Uh, this is the same category, which is like building a sliding drawer in a cryogenic uh, cabinet. Sounds wild to me, um, but every time I've bet against those guys, I've been wrong, and they've actually made it happen. So I look forward uh, to seeing this system up and running, 
Um, the only thing that needs to be culled in our system is the Nibium nitride detectors. We've been making a big investment in an alternative material. Uh, it is not YBCO, it is not a type 2 superconductor, it is a manufacturable metal uh, superconductor. Uh, this would allow us to go to much higher temperature. Here you can see a year's worth of work where we're pushing that up into the regime of 30 Kelvin. This would be hugely impactful uh, for larger systems. To put these numbers in context, this is the Stanford Linear Accelerator. It is walking distance from my house. This does about 10 kilowatts of cryogenic cooling power at 10 Kelvin. This is built by our chief product officer, Nicholas Kalez, who was previously uh, chief engineer there. Um, and then, yeah, that kind of brings us to, to the end here. So we spent 15 years uh, in the university doing basic science, proving that we could entangle photonic qubits on a chip. The company has, for the last few years, been in a regime where semiconductor process enablement has been the long pole in the tent, the slowest piece of our development. I think we're in incredible shape there. The end is very much in sight uh, in terms of getting all these materials into the chip. And we're heading into a regime where infrastructure, concrete, and steel are really the overarching uh, challenges. I think it's very, very exciting uh, to be in that regime. Uh, just finally, I want to plug a recent result that we put on the archive. Um, this is a completely at the other end of the spectrum to what I've been talking about. We have a 25-person team that works on fault tolerance, uh, uh, architecture, etc. And they recently had a result which reduces the runtime for fault tolerant algorithms by about 50x. Uh, this means that with about 1,000 resource state generators running at a gigahertz clock, we would be able to factor RSA 2048 in about nine hours. Now, a gigahertz clock is very aggressive, uh, probably too aggressive. We probably need one or two extra orders of magnitude uh, in that recipe, but this is a huge result generically for fault tolerant compilation, and I encourage you to read the paper. So apologies uh, to go over time. I should say I feel so grateful to speak at this conference and to get to work on this technology. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.